All right, welcome to today's edition of the interview broadcast series. Um, I'm here today with Jamie Baker, who's a news reporter for WTOV. Jamie, well, thank you for joining us. Hey, thanks for having me. So tell us a little about your background. Um, I have been in the TV business since 2009. Um, I did nine years as a sports reporter and anchor for three different markets. And then just over two years ago, made the transition to the news side of things. So I've been a news reporter at a bureau for a station based out of Steubenville, Ohio for the last now 25 months. So how, how did that transition from sports to news go? I'm interested to see that because I think those are two totally different things. Well, it's funny. I, I was told in college by a professor that if you show that you can do sports, you can pretty much do anything because sports is so off the cuff all the time. You have to adjust to all kinds of different scenarios. Um, so I think the toughest part for me was just, you know, I've never been a person that got into pol politics, um, different things like that, elections. I was always just kind of like, okay, like I'll go do my duty and then, you know, not pay a ton of attention to it. So the hardest part was probably, you know, learning politics, understanding the court system, things like that. But the actual you know, the writing and the making contacts, um, editing, things like that. That's like riding a bike, you know, you kind of get back on and it's a little different than calling a coach every day, but you know, you're talking to your police chiefs, judges, things like that every day. So it, it was a transition just in subject matter, but to tell you the truth, I felt like my years in sports really prepared me to kind of get out there and be ready for whatever came my way. At what point in your, in your career, did you realize that the journalism and broadcasting uh, were the right field for you? Well, I decided literally the summer before my eighth grade year that I wanted to be a sports broadcaster. I've never been somebody who like changed my mind on a lot of things. So I went and majored in journalism, specialization in broadcast at Ohio University. Um, and I just loved it. I love you know, not necessarily like I could go without putting my face on screen, but I love being able to tell stories. It's one of my favorite things. I, I like talking to people. I like hearing where they came from, their stories, what separates them from others. So I always kind of knew this would be perfect for me, just the storytelling aspect of it and being able to use that to help people as much as I could. So I, I don't think there was ever a moment where I was like, man, I picked the wrong field. How much have things changed since you became since you became part of the industry? Oh, so much. Um, I tech, I got my first job in two thousand nine, so it's been eleven years. Um, and back then, I, I believe it's my senior year of college. Um, Twitter was just starting, um, so social media didn't have much of any of a role in my first job. My second job, you started to see a little bit more um, high school kids following on Twitter, things like that. Um, now social media drives the business at this point. Um, people aren't going to a news website to get their news. They're going onto Twitter to see literally up to the second stories, tweets, things like that. Same with Facebook. Um, I know, especially, um, some of the younger ages now are getting into TikTok, uh, Instagram, things like that. And I really believe that at this point, you know, social media is the driving force when it comes to news gathering, um, people who get their news information. And that, that I think has been the biggest, um, most significant change in the last 10, 11 years for me. Do you think that's a good or a bad thing? Both. Um, I think it's great that people can know things right away. Um, you know, I remember when hearing when they killed Osama bin Laden because my brother called me from like a frat party when he was in college and I found out, you know, hours after the fact. Nowadays, something like that would be on Twitter, you would know five minutes later. Um, but also social media has caused this issue with the fake news. Um, you know, you hear the president often complaining about fake news. You will see people calling people fake news on Twitter, on Facebook. And I think a lot of people don't necessarily know how to distinguish between what the real media is, the people who work for your local TV stations, things like that, who spend all day gathering this information, and the people who just throw things up on the internet and claim it to be real. Um, so I think social media has been a huge driving force in the spread of misinformation. 
um, just because anything can be put on there. You know what I mean? It's not like somebody sitting there saying, well, that's not true. We got to take it down. So I think, you know, while it is great for people who need their information and it can get word out there faster, that can also be, you know, it's a double-edged sword. How difficult is it to kind of differentiate from the real news and the fake news? Um, you know, for me, I, I, I don't think it's that difficult. Um, just because I know basically how I go about things. Um, you know, it's, I, I know a lot of people have a hard time believing when people say a source set, an anonymous source set. Um, but I also understand that I have anonymous sources. You know what I mean? So that doesn't necessarily mean it isn't true or it's fake. If you have a source, you're not supposed to say who they are. Um, so there are little, there, there are red flags and, you know, you have to find people you trust in the news, um, whether that's your local newspaper, your local TV station. That's what I say to a lot of people who want to get mad at, depending on, you know, what side of the aisle they are on, um, want to get mad at, you know, national news media, um, you know, the big newspapers. The important thing is to listen to your local people. They're the ones who are going to tell you exactly what's going on because, you know, those of us who work in local TV, for the most part, we aren't making a ton of money. We don't, you know, we run around like chickens with our heads cut off trying to get all these stories. We don't have time to push some sort of agenda that's going to help us. So that's what I always try to tell people. I think it's easier if you stick with your local news who will kind of give you the more generic version of things the way it's happening here as opposed to trying to differentiate between the real and the fake when it comes to stuff online and on some of these major networks. And to me, I think the, the local news people are, are really more genuine because they have a vested interest in the communities that they're covering. Is that correct? That's absolutely correct. That's one thing. I mean, even if we aren't from the area, where we're working becomes our home you know, for that period of time and beyond, you know, I spent three years in Bluefield, West Virginia, which most people have probably never heard of. It's a very, very small town, most Southern part of the state of West Virginia. And it became home. You know, I wanted to correctly provide people information. I wanted to put these community members stories out there to provide, you know, some light because, you know, at that point in my life, that was home. And I, that's another thing I don't think people realize. They're like, well, they're not from here. They don't care. Well, it's, you know, it's our lives too. And we want to correctly report what's going on in our wor worlds as well. It seemed as though when, uh, and for those of you class that don't know, Jamie uh, was previously a sports reporter for WTAJ um, uh, when she lived in Altoona. When, it, when you were doing a news story, it always seemed like you were very much invested in the community. And it, I would have had no idea where you were from. Um, whenever you told whenever you told a story and I always will remember you being a Penn State baseball player for a day and <laughs> and how entertaining that was watching you try to field ground balls with coach Cooper that was oh my gosh that's one of my favorite stories I've ever done that's yeah that's I, I genuinely you know you get to know these people you cover you get to get, know them just beyond their stats and what people see um on the tv you get to know them personally what type of person they are you you learn their family's background and you begin to form relationships with these people so it's important to make sure that you know you are doing right by them also now do you have a favorite story or, or top three of st uh, stories that you've done over your time in news um uh, i have to say and i will always go back to this i think the story that touched me most in my whole time i have been in tv was um covering Josiah Vieira when he was um, with the State College Spikes. For those who don't know Josiah, he suffered from this very rare disease called progeria, where his body actually aged at 10 times the rate of a normal person's. So at eight years old, he had the body while he was, I mean, I, I don't think he could have been more than three feet tall, had the body of like an 80-year-old man. Um, and he loved baseball, <sighs> lived outside of State College, the spikes heard about him, kind of brought him under their wing, and he became an assistant coach. And there was a day a couple years ago, they held, they surprised him and held a Josiah D. Vieira day at the ballpark. They had a bobblehead for him, he got to throw out the first pitch. And I spent the day from 9 a.m. until midway through the game with him. And, you know, this kid was sick. I mean, he ended up passing away two years ago. Um, I think he was 13 years old. He had you know, he couldn't even move anymore. Um, and he was so positive. He 
he, he was just like, well, yeah, I mean, this, this is hard, but I get to be around baseball. I love, and it was just, I walked away that day and was just like, oh my gosh, like that, that his view on life was so eye opening. And it's stuff like that, that you take away. I, I won't remember a lot of the games I covered, things like that, but I'll remember the stories of people that, you know, will stick with me for the rest of my life. What goes into telling a story like that? Because, um, Obviously, I remember Josiah very well, and I was at that game to get that bobblehead, actually. <laughs> um, and I, I, th- I believe I ended up giving my bobblehead to Ashley Chase, and she had a little bit more of a vested interest in him than I did uh, from her time with J- WJAC. But what goes into to telling a, a story? That, I, I'll tell you the truth. That one, um, we, I ran that two days later, and I spent hours that next Sunday. I had so much sound from everybody, picking out the right sound bites making sure the video fit with everything. Um, you put, you put your heart and soul into something like that, especially when it's somebody you want to do well by. Um, that's when, that's what I don't think people realize. They think we go and just write and we're like, nah, whatever. Um, but that one, I, that one specifically, there was a few stories that you, you really, you want to do well by the subject. And, um, yeah, that one took me about two days to write. That's still one of my proudest stories I've ever done. And, it was, you know, it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of genuine thought um, as you're going through it. Is there much of a difference to writing a story maybe in a news article compared to what the finished product is um, on TV? Um, not necessarily. Uh, I try to write as though I am speaking to somebody. Um, I, I try not to sound like a robot you know I know sometimes we hear the stuff on the news and you're like I don't even know what that meant um so one thing I always kind of have taken upon myself is writing as though I'm speaking to a friend um you know especially when I went into news one thing and I will tell some younger people who've just gotten into the business one thing I had to learn was that you know if I don't understand something um there's a good chance 85 percent of the viewers who are watching also don't understand it so if I break it down at a level I can understand, that's a level they can also understand. Um, so that's something I try to do most importantly. And I think it translates pretty well, just being natural and being yourself and kind of making it a conversation as opposed to sitting there and being like, this is how it is and that's what you got to do. And this, people seem to respond better to that when they feel like they can connect with you and understand what you're doing. Where do you see broadcasting moving to or or I guess evolving over the next few years? Well, I think, you know, your local TV, your national TV outlets will always be there. But as I mentioned, social media is the market driver at this point. Um, I wouldn't be shocked if five, 10 years down the road, they had full online news organizations. I mean, they already are starting to do that. I work for Sinclair Broadcast Group and they have an app called Ohio 24-7. And they just broadcast 24-7. Um, you can just click on the app and you can pick what part of Ohio you want to hear about. And there's always somebody on there doing stories. Um, so I think we're going to see a lot more of that where these stations are doing 24-hour broadcasts that you can just pull up on your phone or on your computer and access at any point in the day to get whatever you need. So while I think you know your local TV will always be around, I think a lot more of it is going to shift to the phones and to the computers. Now, what's a typical day look like for you now that you're covering news? Now that I'm covering news, um, the hardest, I think truly the hardest transition um, as a sports person, you know, uh, you know, the day starts at like 2.30 in the afternoon. Um, when I move to news, my day starts at, my shift starts at 8.45. So I get up at 6 a.m., which was the hardest first few months of my life. Um, get up at 6 a.m., get ready, come to work. Um, I usually spend my drive in calling different people, setting up stories, things like that. Get in at 8.45. We spend probably three to four hours of the day going out, doing the interviews, shooting the videos, things like that. And then you come back and for the most part, spend the afternoons writing, editing, um, sending video, doing things like that. I usually have all my stuff written by about four o'clock and then I start making calls for the next day. Uh, I feel a lot more comfortable if I have a story set up for the next day before I leave the office. And then, um, you know, comes to the shows at five and six o'clock. There are live shots. There might just be look lives. There might be breaking news where you're out on a scene. Um, It really changes from day to day. 
So it's, it definitely, it keeps you intrigued. That's for sure. Is there ever um, a difficulty in trying to find those stories? Yes. Yes. There are days where we, we said it's feast or famine. Um, you know, yesterday, I, I believe we shot six stories. There are days where finding two is pulling teeth. Um, so it just, it, it's kind of an ebb and flow. Um, with this coronavirus recently, you know, we've now been doing this, gosh, five, five or six weeks. And it's like, okay, how many more angles can I find for coronavirus stuff? Um, so that, that has been a challenge. I think, um, you know, I heard a news director say, or a friend told me her news director said that, you know, this will be the hardest thing you ever cover in your career. You won't see this come around again and you'll become so much better of a reporter. People are either going to make or break their careers at this point, because if you can't keep up with it, you know, how are you going to do anything else that's difficult? But if you're in there and you're hanging in there, this is going to make you that much better of a reporter. How difficult is it reporting on a pandemic? It's, it's, I don't know. I, I don't let myself, you know, my cameraman and I had this conversation maybe two weeks or so ago where I, I don't really let myself look at the big picture part of it because I think when you do that, it gets very overwhelming and you start to go down these rabbit holes and then all of a sudden you're like, we're never going to survive this. Um, so I've just been taking it day to day and, you know, it's a lot of, you have to come up with story ideas. That's the toughest part is, you know, when this started, I wrote down a list of about 25 different angles that we could cover. And as things change, you know, you add things to that list. Um, and I guess I, I was just saying, I feel like I've kind of almost, this has become normal to me at this point. Um, West Virginia is beginning to reopen today. Um, they are opening hospitals, PCPs, dentists, places like that. I believe a few daycares too. So now the angle will shift to how's this going to work? You know, how safe is this going to be? Are people going to be getting sick? Um, but the pandemic, it has been interesting, you know, like I have to put my microphone on, you know, one of those poles you would put um, a paintbrush on to interview people so we can stand six feet back. When we go into stories, we have to wear masks, um, you know, constantly, constantly washing my hands. So things like that, they, they are weird, but uh, you know, at this point, six weeks in, it's kind of like, okay, well, I guess I've gotten used to it at this point because it feels almost a little more natural than it did maybe a month ago. Now, how do you, how do you, how are you able to portray things that are going on when it's so negative out into a positive light? It, it can be tough. Um, that's, there's, there are a lot of negative things. Um, and when you have days where there's sad stories or the tough ones, you have to remind yourself that this is information that you need to be delivering to people. Um, I have tried to make it a point to find a few stories a week that don't have anything to do with the coronavirus, if I can. Um, whether that means a follow-up on a story from a few months ago, or yesterday we were really lucky, the sheriff's department down here got a brand new comfort dog, this eight-week-old golden retriever. And I think it was the biggest hit on our Facebook page and our website over the last two weeks, because it was just a puppy. You know, it was literally a puppy. So you try to find those little things or find stories about people who are getting through this and still doing okay. They're surviving it and they're proud of it. So that's kind of what I try to do. I said, you don't want to just do like negative story after negative story because it wears on you too, mentally and emotionally. What kind of advice do you have for somebody that's trying to break into the field? Um, if you want to get into journalism, I, I always say this, you have to truly, truly love it. Um, especially in the beginning, you know, you're going to start in some small place. There's a decent chance you've never heard of. You're not going to be making very much money. Um, the job is more of a lifestyle than it is a job. You know, it's all the time. Um, so if this is something people want to get into, I always say, make sure this is something you truly love. Because that first two years, you're either going to say, I'm doing this forever, or you're going to be done. Um, so that's my biggest thing. Be, go in. If you're going to do it, be prepared. It's not easy. Um, but if it's something you truly love, it's worth every minute of it. Awesome, Jamie. I, I don't want to hold you back from, from Joan to chase your next story. Um, and I actually have to hop on a faculty meeting call. So <laughs> I want to thank you again for, for joining us. This has been uh, Jamie Baker with WTOV in Steubenville, Ohio. Hopefully someday you'll be able to pop into our classroom and, and give us your insight again. No, heck yeah, anytime. <laughs>